And just a little bit about myself, I've been um, part of the Xbox team since, I guess before we launched 360, so this is about 2004 era. I was part of the team that originally designed the Blades, you guys, if you guys remember that. Um, I worked on Zune, the Zune ecosystem for a couple years, and then I came back to um, lead the design work on the NXC experience, which is what you kind of see today with the slots and channels. Um, and then most recently with the Connect. So let's get into here. So I think what I wanted to start with is a little bit about expectations. And I think a lot of the expectations you have around the idea of natural interfaces, gesture interfaces, or voice interfaces, unfortunately has been uh, kind of initiated by Hollywood. So, you know, these are some, some of the Story obvious examples, like Minority Report. Oh, registration. Just watch this for a sec. See if I can capture an address here. Running out of time. And I'm just thinking maybe I play hockey, stay home today. Can you grab that? It's unclear. I got six licenses. Where do you want them? Over here. Let's mute that. So let's just that go. So that's a great example of a gesture kind of interface. Blade Runner, fantastic movie. Pull back. Wait a minute. Go right. Stop. Enhance 5719. Track 45 left. So voice based input. I don't want this wind up in the wrong hands. Maybe mine can actually do some good. And then something more contemporary like Iron Man. So I think these three examples, you know, and then the one in the upper left, the classic one from, I guess that was Wrath, no, that was Star Trek IV, I think it was, where Scotty thinks it's like, you know, talks to the computer, a computer, you know, and it's like, ah, oh, I gotta use a keyboard and mouse. And I think there's all this kind of expectation that's been set with Hollywood about how natural, how uh, reliable, robust these interfaces can, you know, are, can be. And so people have these expectations that voice is going to work 100% of the time. It's going to recognize my voice perfectly. And uh, um, if I'm moving my hands to control an interface, it's going to be totally obvious and intuitive. And um, all I can say is, gee, thanks a lot, Hollywood, because it makes our job way, way harder once, once you start doing this for real. You realize that. Um, the Tom Cruise, you know, whatever. It's the whole sign language thing is, is, is more um, akin to um, learning like a CAD program versus something that's, uh, uh, that you can use your real life experience to, to actually control. So, so we have to almost overcome uh, what we call public expectations, okay? It's basically it's the, the idea of um, people want things to work a certain way that's been set and it's, you know, whether this tech can make, exist today um, and realize those, uh, those expectations is something we have to, to definitely overcome. Um, we don't really have any kind of common gesture language that's been defined to date. I mean, you can say that the sign language is a kind of gesture language that's, but for as far as like a standard way of manipulating uh, interfaces, um, that hasn't really been defined, especially with air gestures. Um, I mean, this is just like saying, uh, the car. You have a car. Okay, steering wheel. You got that. There's an ignition usually or a button now, I guess, for some newer cars. But, you know, it, it took a while to get to a point where there was a standard way of building an interface into, into these systems. Um, and it doesn't happen overnight. And I think with the explosion of all these kind of gesture-based and natural-based controls, we're just starting to scratch the surface on what these could be. It'll be a few more years, I think, before we get to the point where we sort of say, well, we know that a mouse should work this way. It should have X number of buttons. A select means a click or you know, double click. Um, right click is properties, et cetera, et cetera. We're not quite there yet, but that's a challenge for us. Um, Place-based education, I'm gonna get more into this, is, is really interesting too. Um, I think uh, trying to tell people about what, what's your environment that you have to interact with, where you're supposed to stand, um, so that the, the tech can see you, I think is a big challenge right now. This is something that can get better over time, but right now it's a big, uh, it's a big concern of ours, and especially if you're talking full body gaming. Um, tech is also incomplete, as I mentioned. So the analogy that I always like using is, you know, you're flying an airplane and it's still being built, or you know, the, uh, the, the landing gears haven't been created yet and you've got to land this thing. So that's kind of what, what Connect was, was like, and uh, at least now we've come out with uh, the, first, the first version of it, something that we can build on. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the play space stuff, like I was alluding to before, and I want to show you this is this really fun, Research video. Um, oh, 
about a person being asked to move into the play space. So I thought this was kind of funny because she's like moving the whole chair, okay, into the play space and you know, and she doesn't move the table out of the way. She doesn't do any of this kind of stuff. But this is fascinating because we were, you know, part of one of the things we're trying to do is educate people on what do you do to set up your environment and. People are so ingrained um, to this point that you know when you're playing video games, you're sitting back on your couch, you're leaning, you're, you're down, and um, we're t we have to educate people. Educate people that you need to clear space. You got to stand up and get get things out of the way. That this became a huge problem, and I'll talk about how we how we I think eventually tried to solve it later on. But this is just to give you an example of how fundamental a problem the kind of education needs to be done uh, to talk when you start talking about full body gaming. This is a great example of what expectations are of people. So. Let's keep going here. Um, so one of the things we really tried to establish very early on, whether it was talking about interface design or the game experiences or um, media experiences like Zune, is to try to establish some foundation principles or um, like in the previous talk, maybe something like pillars of what all these experiences should be. So I'm going to share some of them with you. So fast to fund. Okay, I mean the point is that you can just hop right in and you can use your real world experience and you kind of intuitively know how to operate and ma manipulate um, objects in, you know, in a game or in, a, in an interface. Um, alluding to the real world shall be your teacher. Um, sure, you have to, um, there may be some things that you have to learn like a symbolic gesture or, or two because it's unique to the system, but for the most part, if you know how to, if something looks like a door handle in the real world, you guys already know how to use a door handle. So let's see if any of those kind of real world learnings, all the years of you just being a human being can be applied to a system, can be, uh, can be applied and, and made effective to, so that you can ease that learning curve into whatever it is that you're trying to interact with. Um, easy in, easy out um, is another one too, is that there should be a, a very low path to getting into a game and then also popping out and having somebody else ju jump in and out of the experience. Easy switching of identity and um, uh, control of the system was, was a big goal of ours. Um, and above and beyond, it was about this idea about giving you superpowers. And I think when we start talking a little bit about the voice um, interface into Connect, um, that's where you start seeing a little bit of this magic about you know that stuff that Hollywood was showing with Blade Runner stuff. It's not that far away, and it actually is pretty freaking cool. So, um, and of course, I'm never going to use Shout in a presentation again, or shall. So, um, so. I want to talk, switch gears away from games for a second and talk specifically about Dash or the dashboard, what kind of uh, requirements that we had. So uh, unlike a lot of games, we have this problem of, you know, even though Dave mentioned that yeah, it's about getting up out of the chair, but a lot of people want to sit back in their couch. You know, they're, they're got like some, let's say the proverbial beer in their hand. They're sitting here on the couch, you know, laying down and they have this expectation of flipping a remote control, flipping channels on the TV and they want to have a beer in the other hand, right? So that's the, the interface that we have to try to provide for people is one that supports that. So one that works equally well for seated or for standing. Um, we have a long list problem, the idea that there's big collections of, uh, of information and ways to filter them. That's something that's unique to Dash. I guess a lot of game titles might have that if you have a big inventory system or um, you know, if you've got some kind of application that you have to filter through large uh, sets of data, you might have the same, the same problem as us. Um, we're actually about featuring the partners, okay, on the system when you're talking about the dashboard. We don't want to have people play with the interface. We want them to get into the content as quick as possible. So to speak to the easy in or easy out or fast in, we want people to get to the content experiences, the games, the media, the movies, whatever, as fast as possible. Um, educating users, um, the play space, thing is a, a great example. Or the idea of what is the equivalence of the A button, you know, with this new world, the selection mechanism, or going back, or paging. There's a kind of, you know, NUI or Connect 101 that the system has to um, undertake. And I think with, when you look at your games, um, if there is any kind of uh, new paradigm you're introducing with gestures or with voice and stuff, you have to build some time into your uh, development cycle to address that. Just this is the equivalent of that tutorial mode or that, you know, get you into the game kind of thing. There's, there's a burden that you have to overcome to, uh, to, to absorb into your schedule to, to address that. Um, we have a uh, legacy user experience, so all the slots and channels and expectations of how things are organized. We had that to factor in. It wasn't like starting from scratch. And of course, building for the future was another key, key thing. So 
Um, quickly, another eyesore here about um, with a PowerPoint slide, but a, a good way to look at the problem is to think about something called the input stack. So we kind of looked at core actions, so things like select, back, browse, scroll, accelerating, jumping around in the system, and text input as kind of the core basic interactions you would have with the interface. And then once you understand what those core actions are, and you're for, for your game world, you may have a different set. We're just saying that this, I'm just saying this is the set that we use for the, uh, for the dashboard. But once you have that, then you start looking at different options around interaction that you could do. And I think a lot of this may even overlap with um, what Anton had talked about earlier too. Um, the idea of direct versus indirect manipulation. Should you interact directly with an object or do you have a ratchet or some kind of widget or something that slides something indirectly, um, a scroll bar or something like that? Um, is it exclusive? Is it one form of input modality at a time? So I'm always using a gesture, or always using a voice. Or is there some kind of cooperative or assisted way of doing it? So I'll do a gesture for a while, and then I could say more like that. Or um, you know, I'll use a controller for a bit. And if, I, if it was a game, maybe the core action is with the controller. But if I lean left or right, then it may lean a character left or right. That's like a cooperative kind of way of thinking about natural. Um, one or two-handed, is it handed at all? You know, and we'll talk about where we landed with the with the dash. Um, cursor, cursorless. That was kind of another big pivot for us. Um, you can go either way. Um, interestingly, the cursor is what a lot of people gravitate towards because they're used to like a mouse and stuff on, on the screen. But um, cursorless actually is closer to, in a lot of scenarios, to more indicative of directly manipulating um, objects on the screen. Because in real world, there's no cursors magically floating around in your in your world, it's your actual hand that grabs and manipulates things. But um, I'll talk a little bit about where we land and why we went with the cursor system. Um, let's keep going through here. Uh, so I like failures. Okay, this is, it sounds like a horrible thing to say, but I feel like you can learn a lot more from failures than you can from the successes. And um, one of the things I'll, I think you should internalize is the idea of failing forward, failing fast. Prototype something really quickly, get an idea out there, take something good from it and then move on. I mean, I guarantee you 99.9% .9 of the ideas you come up with initially aren't going to make it in, in its current incarnation in whatever it ships. So just get it out of your system, learn from it and move on is something you should just internalize. But um, what I want to spend the bulk of the rest of the time on is a lot of motion studies, interaction studies, um, and explorations into what we did with the system over about two years to see what could a new e or natural user and interfaces be like um, in the Xbox 360. So, um, so we're just going to go through a bunch of videos here. So this first one I'm going to show you here in the upper left, that's where we go in here, um, is what we call the Handles Playground. So very early on, a tech that seemed to um, be working very reliably is this idea of a virtual grab point, which we call the handle, that you would kind of move your hand over and um, you would lock onto it and then you do a manipulate kind of an action too. So, so one of the earliest sets of studies we were trying to do is figure out, well, what could the feedback system be like with that? Um, if we had to pull things apart, push things in, pull out towards you, uh, if you had to grab two at the same time, lots of explorations around, around that. And then trying to marry it with what are the basic elements of user interface that you could marry to a particular interaction. So in this case, we have this idea of you know, maybe grab a target, you could page, you could grab a handle page, it's almost like a sliding door that you kind of flip, you could flip around. Here's another cool example of you grab two targets and then you pull them apart. Let's see if it doesn't. And it kind of stretches the content out. Um, this is starting, again, to think about more minority reportish, you know, where he's doing all this kind of stuff where, where he's manipulating slabs of, uh, of virtual squares on the screen and looking at content. So um, if you had to scroll through lists and things like that, what would it be like? Um, all of these, though, are fantastic examples of indirect manipulation. You're not actually grabbing a list and pulling it down or pulling it up like an iPhone. What you're doing is grabbing the scroll bar or the joystick or the virtual dot that scrolls the, 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 uh, the content. So lots of exploration also around cursors, okay, because that was our first instinct was we need a lot of feedback that you know that you're manipulating the system. So this example of, is almost like a I don't know what we call this. It's kind of like a, a, a comet, and it has a tail to it. And um, if you're away from the handle target, it looks diffused. But as you get closer to it, it turns more into a hand. Okay, it looks like the thing that's supposed to slot in 
to the object you're supposed to grab, in which case it's the handle. And then once you've grabbed it, if you slightly move left or right, not enough to scroll, you get to see that little highlight dot that kind of moves around the, uh, the, uh, the circumference of the, uh, of the target um, with something that was giving you, again, more feedback real time of you need to pull it a little bit more left or right um, to, to make some actions happen. Uh, let's look at this one. First, um, explorations into telling people to stand in the field of view. Move left. You know, this one is move right. And then another one says move really far to the right here. And, and you know, what can you do to tell people, hey, to get into the sweet spot for manipulating the, the system, what, what, what is the kind of feedback we could, we could provide? Um, the original goal was actually to try to create some kind of standard way that all titles could use to, uh, to, to you know, some kind of interface that every title would have to tell people to get into their spot. But then we ended up realizing after talking with a lot of the developers that it's different for every game, you know, what the context um, should be. So we just ended up letting the, the title developers do it, you know, what made sense for their, for their world. Um, let's see, let's go look at this last one here. Um, this last little example here is really not a bit of inter uh, interface as far as interaction goes. It's more of a visual treatment. So if you notice that when the, the slots scroll, there, there's a little bit of parallax effect going on. Um, there's a little bit of wobble. They almost have depth okay, into, the, into the slots. And um, this actually is something that it was really just an exploration into updating our design language or the look and feel of the system was, uh, was what this was. But then it became actually really critical once we went to our, our final design about manipulating slots and stuff to actually have this effect to give you the sense that it was like there's these panels that were floating and you had some uh, a way to affect the physics of the world as you moved your cursor around the system. So we actually did bring a lot of this into the, the, final, the final product. Let's keep going through here, a few more things. Um, so here was an a, a attempt to, okay, if you've got your current UI, slots and channels, NXE style, and you were going to add these handle bits everywhere in the, in the interface, what would it be like? So you had a handle below a slot, you had a handle that was for the channel changer, to slip ch you know, we call this the super channel changer kind of control. Um, you know, what, how would you indicate where the targets were? So targets may pop out and then little arrows come around to tell you the affordance of scrolling it left or right, pulling it up or down. Um, let's see, let's get this one going too. Let me pause this. Um, here's another example where sound, okay, was being added to the, uh, um, for the, as part of the feedback. And sound is huge. Sound gives you a lot of, uh, makes it much more richer as far as, you know, am I close to a target? Am I approaching something? Am I farther away? It's very, um, very powerful. Uh, I think we called this sonar as the uh, example. It was a kind of a cursor that, you know, would almost point in the direction of where the nearest handle was, like the aura would kind of glow around it and, and, and point you to the target. Okay, let's pause that one. Uh, more examples on cursors, so it, this is kind of like a jelly cursor and this was a ratchet okay, kind of system where, again, another example of indirect manipulation where, hey, you've got this kind of virtual dot or something. This is, this is just like a scroll bar, really, is, you know, if you want to think about it in, in uh, current um, UI design for, for you know, PCs and things like that. Um, but uh, people got this. It doesn't seem, it's not very playful, I'll tell you that right now, but people understood this idea because they've seen scroll bars and things in the, in, in the real world. So, um, so it was worthwhile to explore. And then, um, again, another example of a different kind of cursor. This one starts borrowing some of the brand language and elements from Xbox, you know, kind of that, that swirl pattern that we have. And this is like the first example of, that I remember, where we have what we call a rail. Um, let's loop around again. Where you see the rail, you see that strip, the vertical strip or the horizontal strip that tells you, okay, this is the direction you have to pull and manipulate in. And we actually ended up bringing that also as well into the final design. Okay, let's keep going here. Um, but we're not all about gestures. When we talk about natural, natural could also mean voice. So where do we start off with voice? Well. Um, this was one of our first prototypes in thinking about conceptually what voice could be. Xbox. So there'd be a word cloud that all go to. Kind of... And then you get suggested different words to say. Games library. You get a confirmation and you jump to the library. So this was the very beginning. Xbox, of... go home basically how we built the grammar of 
the voice interface or the VUI system in, our, in, in, our, in the Xbox. Um, you know, really, it's teach per people one keyword. In this case, it's Xbox, and then gradually give them more words to build up their grammar over time. So Xbox, okay, words come up. Games library, okay, you know, go to games library. And over time, people wouldn't have to wait for all those words to pop up. They would just know Xbox games library, say it in one phrase, and they could just launch right there. So the voice system is one that would be very friendly to new users as well as ones, you know, as, as well as for people who are more experienced with the system. So, um, you know, here's an example of how you voice could be used where Mr. while media is playing. This is one of the most powerful uses for voice. Anybody level five who doesn't belong there. You want me to kill your partner? Do it, yeah, and the, I will uh, let you go. The idea that there would be an overlay on top of the media, um, which would give you hints at kind of what words you could treat. say. She's obviously gone um, after one of them. Who is and I'll, talk, I'll, I'll show another video in a bit about okay, what the actual grammar was that we ended up with. This must be um, but you can imagine words like play, fast forward, pause, rewind, overlaying on top of the, uh, the interface. It's, uh, um, your brother tried to kill me. He took Silas' ability, and now he's suffering the consequences. We're in a lot of trouble. You have to tell me where. Okay. And then I talked a little bit about the initial educating people, you know, NUI 101. How do you teach people how to use the system? So this was a very um, early concept on what could the initial, when you first turn on the console and you're setting up your, setting up your system, what could it be like? What if it was more like a game? What if it was, what if it was more inviting? And you learn very quickly, you know, that it's, okay, you learn the basics of hover selecting to select an object, that you have to pick an avatar, you know, that represents yourself. Um, it felt like it was a world that you were just kind of walking through. Um, this seems really, um, you know, uh, basic kind of stuff, especially coming from the game design world for you guys, but as far as like a platform for a setup for a system, I mean, this is, you know, this is, this, this was radical to show it to the, the execs, believe it or not, and, uh, um, a lot of people were very apprehensive about going in this um, direction. They thought it was too cartoonish, too, um, too dumbed down. But you know, the alternate is you turn on your console, first time you set it up, and you've got lists, these, these menus of things. And if this is supposed to be some kind of groundbreaking product, you know, and your first experience into the groundbreaking product is pick from a list of items that represents your region, I don't think that's so cool. So this was kind of a, a, an attempt to try to put some playfulness right up front into the, into the experience. And then an uh, example of the play space uh, video, safety things. This is where we started going in this direction where, hey, get up out of your chair, you know, and move things out of the way. Uh, seems so obvious, but as I showed you in that or original you know, user research video, people just didn't get it. So we had to be very explicit about telling people to do this. So keep going. So um, some things we learned after doing all these prototypes and stuff. So this is about a year to two years worth of exploration. Um, at least with the current tech, our gestures or any kind of actions in the Z or the Z um, were, were unreliable at the time. So to put any kind of critical functionality um, that you expect to be 100% reliable in the Z, um, we were uncomfortable with, with proposing that. Not saying that it can't get better, and I think it is going to get better um, as time goes on and as our tech gets better and our, our, our algorithms get better, but um, Z at that point in time didn't work well for us. Um, oh, skip through those, yeah. Symbolic gestures as a whole have a, some kind of learning curve. So that's the difference between saying like, you know, if I have to do this, which is a symbolic gesture to scroll, versus I grab an object and pull it, um, directly manipulate the object, that actually has, is easier to learn than kind of trying to learn some kind of gesture. Not saying you can't use it, but there has to be some kind of education that happens if you're going to do that. Um, voice definitely is a superpower. And whenever we showed that demo, that one with the, vo with the mic coming up out of the ground, using Xbox and whatever, people instantly say, okay, that's Blade Runner, or that's, I've seen that before, and, uh, you know, and we were very early on able to demonstrate tech that kind of got us very close to what people had seen in Hollywood. Um, you know, with movies and so forth. So definitely voice is a, is a very powerful, um, natural way of interacting with the system. Um, people prefer direct manipulation, like I said before. And the idea of constant feedback, super important. Um, whether it's visual, um, you know, whether it's, it's constantly rippling, the cursor is moving around, or if there's no cursor, that if you move your hand, something is reacting in the environment, you have to um, take, take that into account. 
um, or the sound, the constant dynamic sound as you're moving around in the interface um, is really, really key too. Uh, even with voice, when you say words, having some kind of feedback that acknowledges you know, a bleep or a confirmed or something like that is, is, is really good um, to make sure that you feel like you trust the system. Um, and then finally, the real world factors need to be addressed. The play space, lighting, um, the size of your skeleton, you know, there's, these are all important factors to teach people um, because this is all new. Maybe in 10 years, five, 10 years, people will be very familiar with what gesture systems can be and how you set it up so you don't need to be so basic. But for right now, this is all brand new. So this is something you have to, to factor in. But what's the big lesson? Well, the big lesson in all this is don't retrofit an existing user experience or interface. Um, I can safely say we probably spent a good year, solid year, trying to retrofit the NXE dashboard to make it new event friendly um, when we realized, hey, this was a system that was designed for controllers. Okay, you know, your standard Xbox controller, up, down, left, right, A, B, guide button, maybe buttons and, and, and triggers. Um, to try to marry another input paradigm on top of it, you're gonna waste your time. Uh, I'm not saying it can't be done, but your energies are better spent redesigning a system or designing from the ground up one that is newly friendly. Um, the one exception, the one kind of star we'll put on top of that is the voice system. So if you remember the voice system and the interface, there was kind of like an overlay that popped up. In that sense, you know, the voice system did work with the controller world because it was agnostic of the UI that was behind it. We could have put basically any UI behind it and I think the voice system would have worked just fine. So, um, uh, so yeah, I guess that you could sit, you could, the takeaway could be that maybe you could retrofit uh, uh, an existing system with voice on top of it. I mean, you might have a little bit more of a success doing that, but I would still put a huge caution around um, just trying to retrofit existing UI. Um, so let's go back to that input stack that I talked about uh, before. Um, you know, the core actions, select back, browse scroll, accelerators, and text input, and talk about what did we end up with with, Connect, with the Connect Hub, which is the interface that we ended up using um, and implementing in the console. Um, well, we got rid of accelerators, or the idea of accelerators are shortcut buttons, um, and we got rid of the idea of text input. And um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot here or anything in the deck about text input, but I'd be happy to talk with people about how we try to solve the text input uh, problem with gestures and voice. Um, definitely come talk to me if you want to do that. But that could be a talk in, unto itself. Um, and where do we land in the interaction options? Well, we went with direct, as much as possible, direct manipulation of objects. Um, exclusive uh, as much as possible and made it very clear to people you're using this input modality, using gesture now or using voice now, or if it's both, tell them very explicitly this is the, uh, the mode you're using. Uh, one-handed to get the broadest uh, range of, uh, of audiences too. So and unlike, have you guys played Dance Central? You guys in, or have you seen that interface? So Dance Central is a great example of a two-handed interface. You gotta use your one hand to scroll through items in the list and then you swipe to select something, but use your other hand to go back, okay? You have to use both your hands to navigate the, uh, the UI. Uh, and there's very specific actions that are mapped to one hand or the other. Our system is not like that. You can put your hand up, select things, or hover select or things, put your other hand down, put the other hand up, and it'll work just fine. Um, and we did go with the cursor system because we thought that was the easiest way to get constant feedback that you knew what was, you know, where your hand was kind of on the screen. Uh, we weren't sure what the final UI was going to be uh, uh, behind the, the interactions. And we weren't sure if we can get all the ripple effects and things like that to give you that feedback. So we decided to just um, go with something that was cursor based. Uh, let's see. So let's just play another video here of kind of close to where we ended up with, with what we call the Connect Hub. So what we said was, let's leave the controller interface the way it is. Slots, channels, maybe we spruce up the design so it looks a little bit more fresh, put a new coat of paint on. But for the most part, it works just like it does today. And this is all controller based. Uh, but you notice at the bottom there, there's a little bit of a tip that's telling you to wave to connect. You know, it's telling you, or say connect. All right, that's the hint that's, hey, if you want to get into the world of connect, just do these couple of things and, and get you into the system. So let's say after you wave, you now kind of shift your view into this world, which is now big targets. And now this is 100% gesture and voice. Okay, it's natural um, with your, just using your natural input system. If you want to use controller, you go back to that world, or you pick up a controller or touch it, and then it flips back to that world. Um, I think in a purest sense, this is 
this probably breaks one of the you know, UI design 101 rules, which is you're essentially creating two UIs for the same content. Um, in, the, in an ideal world, you want one UI that could work equally well in both uh, circumstances. But um, again, given, and this is where the realities of shipping a product come in uh, to play, um, we, had to come up with, we had to come up with this system uh, because we couldn't spend the time to redesign the existing, existing controller uh, UI world. Um, to get it to work, so. Xbox. Play DVD. Previously on Heroes. You have to tell me where Mr. Kidd Xbox. He's not a killer. I'm not gonna send anybody to level Fast high. forward. You want to kill your partner? Do it. Play. Daphne, we gotta find her. Yeah, people always, whenever we played this, and this was probably about a year old, a year, year and a bit old, were saying, okay, I get it. Okay, this is exactly what I want to do with, you know, I'm sitting back in my couch, I'm leaning back, I got the beer in my hand, and I can't find my remote. Okay, how do I control the media? How do I pause? A phone call, phone rings or something like that. I can just say Xbox, pause, pick up my phone, talk to them, and then put it down, and then you can say Xbox, play. It just starts playing. So it's less about, um, again, I don't know what your scenarios are like in your games, Definitely for the dashboard and some of the media playback scenarios that we have in the dash, huge scenario, hugely important scenario that um, we ended up solving um, with the voice. And one of those early Connect UX, you know, kind of um, pillars or, or t uh, principles that we had about voice or something giving you superpowers. This is a great example. When you first time you do Xbox Play, fast forward, everyone feels like, wow, this is awesome. This is, this is something that's giving me a superpower. Um, so. What I want to leave you with is just a little bit of a um, survival checklist. And I think a lot of this stuff is even applicable to, it doesn't matter if you're designing for Xbox or whatever, but this is just a general um, things, observations that I, that I had after uh, being in the industry for a while and specifically work on Connect is prototype everything um, and you know, the idea of failing forward, huge, hugely important. If you guys, guys have like flip cams, your cam, whatever cameras, record everything, record everybody doing everything. Um, all these YouTube videos that are people hacking the connect things are so cool, not only because of what people are, are actually doing with the, 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 the system, but seeing people interact with it from there, you know, if, you're, if the camera's on the person, that's actually more interesting to me a lot of times than what they're manipulating on the screen because people are doing crazy actions, contorting their bodies in certain ways, and it's, it's a, a really easy prototyping thing to do is um, have two cameras, one that's on a person, and play a video of an experience or uh, you know, maybe there's emotions that you have for your game and ask people to come in and say, I want you to act out what you would do if you were gonna control the game um, that's playing in front of you. So you know, let's say a driving game is a great example. That was the first prototype for, the, for, for some of the driving games I saw was they'd capture footage from a game for 30 seconds and ask people, okay, you have no controller, what are you gonna do? People just intuitively start, you know, they put up their hand and they start doing this to accelerate back or, you know, try to push the accelerator and things. Or um, if it's a fighting game, what would you do? Easy. The car has no code there. You just capture some video, two cameras, and then overlay it next to each other. And you can learn a lot just by that very basic kind of technique. Um, the idea of real-time tweaking is uh, in instrumenting your, your engine or your system for um, playing around with timing. Extremely important, too. So much of this is feel-based. You know, um, should the hover select be a second, second and a half, 1.125 seconds? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I mean, just because this is all new, you need to have a system that's robust enough that you can have a lot of sliders and play around with it. Again, it shouldn't be new to you guys working in the, in the games world, but um, just, just keep that in mind. Uh, user research is kind of a luxury that big companies um, uh, are able to, a uh, resource they're able to throw at a problem. Um, being able to do bring groups of people in to evaluate systems. Uh, if there's any way you can build that into a budget or if you're working with a publisher that has those resources, definitely get them on board to help you with this stuff. Um, so much of this is observation of what real, real world um, uh, behaviors are like and um, if you can get more of that into your uh, design cycle for iterating on design, it's going to be good for you. Um, spend time on the UBI or what we call or the out-of-box experience. That's that initial uh, easing people into the experience. Very important too. And then finally, NUI or natural user interface is not a cure-all for every kind of game system out there. I think there is a uh, expectation that um, 
everything in the future is just going to be motion. It's going to be, or it's going to be gesture. It's going to be voice and stuff. I'll tell you, the, the, you know, this thing right here works pretty darn good for flipping through PowerPoints and stuff. And it may be the perfect interface for this application. And I think controllers, you know, your standard, whether it's a DualShock, a three, you know, 360 controller, whatever, is also maybe the perfect input system for a particular set of applications or the steering wheel for a racing game. Um, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Think of Nui as, hey, there's a potentially a new language we could apply to solving some problems. And um, don't forget about the existing input systems. Try to think about them as being complementary as for the ecosystem of whatever it is that you're designing for. That's all I got. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'd imagine that in uh, designing these interfaces that you want the actions and the voice commands to be as natural as possible. And I'm just wondering how you balance those natural motions with intentional motions to ensure that um, these things aren't accidentally triggered um, or, or, you know, um, right. Right, that so, pe people don't unintentionally activate something. So this is just not just gestures, but also with voice and everything else. So, exactly. Um, let me look. Let me talk about both both sides, and I'm going to talk about the voice side first because that's actually easier to uh, to uh, to tackle. So, with the voice systems, um, you have to build a lot of redundancy into your um, and a lot of uh, checks and balances into your the way you build your grammar, so that hey, you don't want to be listening for every word at every step you know, of, your, of, the, uh, of your experience. If you decompose kind of what I, what I said was the system that we did for the 360 with voice, it's very early on, it's just listening to one word, Xbox. Okay? So the idea that you're going to get any kind of false positive or false recognition on anything, um, if you say blah or whatever, it's very, very low. Like Xbox is also a good word to use because it doesn't sound like so much any, uh, like anything else out there. Um, and interesting with voice too, it gets better the longer the string is that you have to reco, the more accurate it becomes. Um, the I hinted at text input being a really difficult problem. One of the places that we thought voice might be able to help with text input is instead of you know hunting and pecking on a virtual keyboard, you could just say the letters. Um, but you know, B sounds like D, sounds like E, sounds like G, sounds like, you know, it's, and it doesn't help. Then if you start going the other way where you s try to reco whole phrases and stuff, then you get huge latencies in the system because you've got to reco, you got to reco a, a wave file against something that's probably sitting up in the cloud, some service, and then return results. So then it becomes really laggy and slow. So hence, we did not solve it, <laughs> the text in pro input problem with voice. So, so, with, so just in summary, with the voice side of things, you just want to build in smarts about not trying to essentially boil the ocean. You only want to listen for the right words at the right time in the right context, and that'll make your accuracy go up. And then look for words and phrases that um, won't be confused with anything else. Um, with gestures um, and, uh, and you know, uh, air, air gestures and manipulation, um, I think inherently, you know, all these systems require almost like two steps. Okay, you have to have one step, which is target something and express intent. This is the thing that I want to target, and then the second step is do the manipulation. So, and I can't think of a way where you could do it with just with one step. So, in our world, the two steps are you hover over, let's say, um, you know, a handle, which is something you can grab for a certain amount of time, and then you can pull it left, right. But they, that time interval of you locking there is that a little bit of, get, you know, kind of the, the forgiveness of if you're just pushing your hand over the thing and you accidentally select things, um, you can avoid that. So whether it's a time thing, whether it, it could also be even with two hands, like maybe the, the con confirmation is one to kind of put over, you know, an object and then put the other hand up and that locks you into the object. That's kind of getting closer to a minority report where are using two handed uh, kind of stuff. Um, that's a way you could, you could also solve it. Um, but, you know, as you start going more and more into direct manipula manipulation of objects, it does become a problem because times where you're just trying to put your hand down, it might be registering as a system as, hey, you just want to scroll the list, you know, and, and, and uh, you have to just be smart with um, trying to think about those two steps that I talked about. Like one is like that target lock on the thing and then the second is the manipulation. Whether it's a using a, a two hands, whether it's a voice thing, whether it's a time thing, you just need to have some kind of input in there to, uh, to confirm that that's the thing that you want to manipulate. There isn't anything prescriptive that I can suggest for you. So, still learning too. So. Has Microsoft ever taken into consideration using two cameras for a better uh, sense of depth? Um, 
let's see. So this is starting to get into tech land uh, stuff, which is not 100% um, my my forte. But I think the uh, um, you know, I know in the research things, they've looked at all kinds of systems, whether it's one, two, n number of in ways to get more input is really the way I'm going to abstract it, whether it's two sensors, two cameras, whether it's some combination of RGB with uh, the depth, you know, in camera. Um, I don't know specifically what we've been looking at, but I think the, that uber point of that Z or the Z axis being kind of unreliable, I think, is where we're getting at. It. It's like, how can we improve the system, the tech, so that we can start using Z in depth um, as something that is, it feels just as good as moving, translating kind of more in an XY kind of plane parallel to the screen. And I think, um, I wish I could give you a specific example of what, you know, what we've done, but all I can tell you is that uh, we're just looking at ways to get that Z, you know, that depth thing more, more robust and more reliable. If you had two cameras, let's say one that was sort of behind you and one in front of you, sure, that would make it a lot better that you could see. Uh, more around you in the space, but um, I'm not going to be prescriptive and say that's the solution that we're going to do. I think we're looking at everything right now. So I don't know if that really answers your question. That's kind of the little dance because I'm not quite quite sure what to uh, uh, to say tech-wise. But um, it is it is the the Z and the Z um, push thing is something we are um, looking heavily at because I know that we start looking at interfaces being more 3D, whether it's with displays presenting stuff that looks like it's floating or using environments in the UI that actually feel more 3D. Um, I think it's really uh, super, um, super interesting to, uh, to, to explore. So yeah, are you guys um, planning on, I, yeah, I think the Kinect is all really exciting for everybody and its implications mm -hmm. for uh, making video games, but uh, is there any plans to have something um, out that increases the bone count or um, sort of, uh, are you pushing it further? Excuse me, from tech perspective, is like, like more, more joints, yeah, more yeah, things more like joints, that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is this is the tech, like this is V1. You know, yeah. this is like we invented something called the keyboard, right? And yeah. we barely even know how many keys there should be on it, r let alone where they should be oriented and how do we use it for. So this is V1 of the keyboard yeah. or V1 of the mouse. And it took a long time before those input devices were actually mature enough to a point where you knew how to use it and that it was performing. What, the way you expected, so um, absolutely, that's one of those tech things where you know the sensors will become more reliable, faster, um, you know, more sensitive microphones and things like that. That's all stuff that's coming cool. down. The Anything soon? That's that. Oh. Anything soon? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe wait and see. Cool. Anyways, thank you so much. Um, I'll be around if you guys want to talk about the stuff. I love talking about this stuff. So thanks.